are possible when we really do the work. Really do the work to focus on keeping customers, patrons, supporters, we have the center of what we do. That is not job change. That's the difference between a thriving organization and one who's trying to keep their head in the water. Okay, so question. Who here wants to grow their audiences so that they are, have enough revenue to do the projects and initiatives you want to do? Woo! Woo! Good answer, love it. So one more time by way of introduction, my name is Aubrey Burriar, as Catherine said, I'm currently the Executive Director of the California Symphony. For just a few more days, I am transitioning to full-time consulting work, impacting other orchestras like this one across the country, doing a lot of workshops, a lot of talks just like this. And as Catherine mentioned, just by uh, continuing way of introduction, some of my background, I've been at the California Symphony five years. Before that, I spent a decade in Seattle. They're working for the leading institutions, Seattle Symphony, Seattle Opera, and the Bumbershoot Music and Arts Festival. And all of this is to say that my experience is at organizations of all sizes. And the things we're going to be talking about today are the opinions I've been forming, the work I've been doing at every single one of those organizations. So it's not one size fits all, but there's a lot of things I've learned over 15 years of doing this work. So. As I mentioned, five years ago is when I came to the California Symphony, and at that point, the California Symphony radically changed its approach to audience development. And this slide gives away the end of the story. So you can see, on the left is the national trend for American orchestras. This data comes straight from the League of American Orchestras. On the right is the California Symphony data over a similar time period. And we talk about changing the narrative. Subscription revenue, the rest of the country is down, on decline. California Symphony up nearly 30%. Total audience size, we have doubled our audience over the last five years. Who wants to sell twice as many tickets than they do now? Um, subscribers who also donate the rest of the country is at 28%. The California Symphony are at 43%. And you will hear me say, we do not solicit our first year subscribers for a donation. So if you take that out of the equation, 62% of all second year and longer subscribers are donating. Earned revenue of 32%, the rest of the country is slightly down. Contributed revenue is on the rise nationwide. California simply doubled that trend. Total income growth, uh, when I made this slide, it was about 40%. The updated number is about 50%. Our operating budget has grown in the five years they've been there. So the question for you all is what if even a fraction of these gains were true of this organization? Can you imagine what the two sons have some of these numbers are true. This is how the narrative has changed with the California Symphony. And anybody who reads my blog knows that's what I talk about. Changing that narrative. Testing those assumptions we just rattled off and saying, you know, maybe I will choose not to believe that that's true. That there is a different way. So that's what this is. A really different story than most are able to tell. So we're going to break it down into three parts today. The first is what most organizations are doing and why. There's a lot of good reasons why we do things the current way, so we're going to talk about it. And those are barriers to change. So then we're going to talk about how do we start to overcome those barriers and have an institutional mind shift so that we can do this work. <coughs> and lastly, we're going to talk about operational implementation. What does it look like when the whole team, the staff, the board, the musicians, the volunteers, everybody is aligned and on the same page talking about how do we serve our customer? so that we have this kind of problem. So, the current way, the current model, this right here, we're gonna talk about the typical orchestra patron journey. So this is what most orchestras are doing and why. So here's the problem. Nationwide orchestras, this is just data straight from the League of American Orchestras, 90% of first-time attendees never come back again. Ninety percent of new attendees at orchestras across the country never come back again. So let's look at let's look at that uh, the path and why this is. So let's say you're a first-time attendee at an orchestra. What happens after you buy your first ticket? <laughs> Somebody say it, you know. You get solicited. Get solicited for a donation. The development department says, oh my gosh, they clearly are into us. 
she loved asking for money. And then the, the marketing department says, well, wait a second, I want a piece of that. They're a first time buyer, and they are so savvy. We've got that tracking cookie on their browser, and we're going to show them digital ads on their mobile desktop, whatever else, all over the place. Uh, and then we say, oh, but maybe they want season tickets. They came once, clearly they want to come to an 18 concert package. <laughs> so we start sending the subscription brochure in the mail, and then the development department says, wait, wait, wait! We have a fundraising appeal going out. Let's send them that too. Okay, I call this the free-for-all model, because what happens is that the patron is just bombarded with information and messages from our organization, and there is no clear path on what to do next. There's a bunch of different paths, and it's not coordinated, and it's not focused. So, I already said 90% of first-time attendees don't come back. That means 10% are the number who do. That 10% becomes a multi-buyer or a repeat buyer. And then what happens? This whole rigmarole happens all over again. All the messages, all the next steps, all the different things we want from them. And somehow, some small percentage of patrons do sort of make their way up this jungle gym of a patron journey. Some do become season ticket holders. Some people do become renewing subscribers. And some people eventually do become donors. And about the time our organizations get to renewing donors and major donors, man, do we get our act together and get really focused on what the next steps are for those individuals. A lot of times we call that <coughs> management, we call that cultivation plans. Why does it take that long for us to get so focused on what we want the path for the relationship to be? So I call this the free for all model. Oh, and if this looks like a mess, there's a good reason for that. It's because it is a mess. There's a better way. At the California Symphony, we said, we're going to redesign this whole patron journey. So we reconstructed the model on the left and said, if there is one next step and one next step only, what would that look like? We said, if you're a first time attendee, if 90% don't come back, the only next step we want you to take is to come back. Then you're a multi-buyer or a repeat buyer. Then we say the only next step are repeat buyers, they are then our top prospects for season ticket holders. Then we start soliciting for season tickets. Then, here's another uh, sort of alarming stat nationwide. About 50% of first-time subscribers, so new season ticket holders, about 50% don't renew. Yeah, mm, that's, a good, that's a good response. Mm. Uh, so we say if you're a new ticket holder, or season ticket holder, the only thing we want you to do is renew that subscription. Then when somebody is a second year subscriber or longer, then the relationship comes to the point where all the data says you are ready for a donation ask. Then we start talking about new donations. If you're a donor, we want you to renew that gift. And then again, major donor, of course, at some point we're trying to upgrade and increase those levels of support. In other words, no matter who you are, from first time attending, brand new visiting the organization, to subscriber, renewing subscriber, donor, long time loyal donor, no matter where you fall on that continuum, we have a plan for you. A plan and a next step, and one next step only. And equally important to what we do do is what we don't do. And that is to say, we do not solicit for a donation until somebody is a second year subscriber or higher. This is usually where the development folks start like, grabbing their chair and getting a little uncomfortable. But you saw the numbers. We nearly doubled our audience donor households have nearly quadrupled by having restraints, by having discipline, by having focus. This is about building relationships with our patrons <coughs> over the long haul. I call this the long haul model. That's the free for all model. This is the long haul. So, if that's what orchestras are doing, let's talk about why that is. There are five reasons why we do things in the current way. The first is revenue. We make money the current way. Under this model, some people do become a subscriber after coming once or twice. Some people do become donors that first time they're called. We make money this way. But the problem is that 
on average, our organizations are focusing on incremental gains, incremental tweaks. And we know that as an industry, those incremental gains and incremental tweaks do not keep pace with the increase in expenses. We have a highly labor intensive art form. I see naughty heads, you all know this. It always costs more next year than it does this year. So at some point, these incremental tweaks, incremental gains, do not keep pace with the rising cost to do this business. So if there is money the current way, I am here to say there is way, way, way more money the new way. By focusing not just on acquisition, but on retention, we have seen that in the growth, total 40%. And I, as I said, this year just ended with all 50% total income growth over the last five years. It's a difference between acquisition and retention, keeping the maintenance that we have. That growth is across both tickets and contributed, earned and contributed revenue. The second reason why we do things the current way are metrics. Who here has heard the phrase, what gets measured gets managed? Yeah, some of you, good. Uh, a lot of us are measuring and therefore managing the wrong things. This is happening across the country. This is not just here. So some examples, you know, I hear a lot of organizations talk about the size of the database. A bigger database does not mean we are serving more people. A bigger database means we are serving a lot of people once. And when our jobs are to create lifelong, loyal lovers of our art world, serving them once is pretty bad. Metrics like a larger mailing list. You know, I've done list trades, I've got all these people. A larger mailing list, list, whether for fundraising or for marketing, is not a measure of success. In fact, looking at the response rates would be a better gauge of how successful that campaign so instead, what I'm trying to say is look at metrics that measure loyalty. All of the research shows that we can just get a patron to have a second visit within a 12 month period of their first visit, their lifetime value to our organization skyrockets. Now, lifetime value is very difficult to measure. I don't even know if you guys are on Tessa Tour or what database, I forget it. But, uh, but it's a difficult metric to measure. However, what is more easy to measure is the three-year value of a patron or the five-year value of a patron and at the california symphony when we look at the three-year value of a patron before doing this work and compare that to the three-year value of a patron after starting this work man is that really telling information metrics that matter metrics that measure loyalty the third reason why we do things the current way is short-term emphasis we as arts administrators have incredible pressure to, to perform in the short term. When I first began at the California Symphony, I was brought in for a financial turnaround. And I remember I'm meeting with our big donors, I'm meeting with our big funders, and these are things I'm doing the first few weeks on the job. And our biggest foundational supporter said, look, we've been supporting you for years and years. We are tired of seeing budgets end in the red. You have one year to bring this organization to the black or we are done. And in fact, if you don't have a budget break even or surplus for two years in a row, we're done here. Now, the end of the story is we did it. And I just renewed that funder. We're on the second year of another three year grant. We're getting ready to ask them for even more. We got there. But talk about the pressure to perform in the short term. I was coming in. I had a plan. I had this whole long haul model. And they said, no, you've got a few months to start performing. Okay. So, and I pick on that one funder, but the reality is, as arts administrators and our professional staffs are under this kind of uh, pressure to perform in the short term all the time. Okay. Another reason why we have pressure and short term emphasis are some of the watchdog organizations, organizations like Charity Watch, GiveWell. Um, some of those are changing their tune, uh, Guide Star is getting better, but what they do is they start rating us on. Uh, Things like you know percentage of overhead and all these things that really just aren't talking about loyalty over the long term. They're metrics that don't matter. And instead, we have this pressure to, to perform in the short term. Okay, another reason why we have short-term emphasis 
is our boards. Now, I'm not here to throw our boards under the bus. There are board members in this room, I know that. So we're going to talk more about boards in a moment. But the point for now is to say that this type of long-term approach has to have buy-in from the top. So again, we're talking board, we're talking executive leadership, we're talking staff. We're going to talk more about boards in a moment. A fourth reason why we do things currently. No culture for failure and lean, lean budgets. So if you're tracking with me so far, you know that when there is tremendous short-term pressure to maximize incremental revenue, and budgets are lean and getting leaner. We have cut and trimmed every single place we possibly can. That means there is no room for experimentation whatsoever. Right? We all have, all of us, orchestras across the country, have top-notch artists, education programs that are making a difference, initiatives that are impacting our community in a deep and meaningful way, and failure to find on any one of those fronts. Because an experiment did not pan out in its first iteration, for most of us, is a miss we cannot afford to have. No culture for experimentation. But what we can do in the short term is start saving money. So this graphic here represents the expense savings we can realize when uh, when we start building uh, lists that are qualified, and we're not judging the success of our campaigns over how many people did that mailing go out to, but instead, how many qualified people did it go out to, and it probably brought in the same amount of revenue at the end. I just have been working with an orchestra in uh, nearby where my orchestra is, the Peninsula Symphony. Jesse, I gotta show you the story, because yes, just yesterday I was on my second call with them, doing a series of coaching calls. So they talked about some of this work on the first phone call a couple weeks ago, only a couple weeks ago. Fast forward to yesterday, they said, Aubrey, we used to send our season brochure, there's smaller orchestra than this, we used to send our season brochure out to 15,000, 20,000 people. It cost us $6,000 to do that. They said, we started running a list of like, who is actually qualified to subscribe, recent attendees, past subscribers, not everybody in the database, including all these inactive accounts that we've heard from in years. We said, we got it down, cost us $2,000 to mail the people we wanted to mail to. Guess what we're doing with the extra money, Aubrey? We're going to send follow-up postcards to those people to make sure that they got that invitation to renew that subscription. Then we still have money left over. <clears throat> Second call with them. They're telling me this. I was like, you guys are going to be just fine. They got it. So immediately, expense savings can be realized under this new model by being more focused over who we're communicating with. <clears throat> and then that starts to free us up to have some risk to be able to try new things. And by year two of this model, my music director and I were able to start undertaking some programmatic experiments that we wanted to undertake by year two. Year one was pretty lean. I had that foundation sort of like chirping in my ear saying you gotta balance the budget. Pretty much every other funder felt the same way. But by year two, we started being able to breathe just a little bit more. No culture for failure and lean budgets are are why we continue to do things the current way. So here's the last reason why the current model exists, why we do things the current way. We don't know how to do it any differently. Siloed departments, and particularly siloed development and marketing departments, are a real disservice to this work. And a focus on acquisition versus retention, same thing, disservice to this work. All of this makes it so that our staffs don't intuitively know how to do it any differently. In other words, we are taught that acquisition is key because, you all know this, whatever we don't sell in subscription, we gotta make up that revenue with single tickets, right? Whatever we don't make in single tickets, we gotta fill that void with donations, right? So we are taught that acquiring new people is the only way to make it work. And that's one of those assumptions we're gonna challenge. We don't know how to do it any differently. Uh, we are taught, in other words, to execute the free-for-all model that exists. I remember, I don't know if anybody's ever said this here, but I remember when I was at uh, both Seattle Symphony and Seattle Opera. At the Symphony, I worked in development. At the Opera, I worked in marketing, so I've been sort of on both these teams, and we would say things like, tell me if you've ever heard this, 
who owns those names? Anybody? Mm -hmm. I hear like you know, nervous laughter. <laughs> uh, who owns those names? And the reality is the question like who owns those names is like the most siloed question. Mm -hmm. It's not putting the patron of the center at all. Who owns those names? That's a short term question. The current way has been in effect for the last 30 to 40 years. And as we said, for a while it worked. Now, those of you who were at the AXO conference last week, remind me, raise your hand if you were at AXO last week. You heard Patty McCord speak on Saturday. Almost all of you, good. Patty says, uh, this is one of the first things I've ever heard her say, and I was like, this woman is so smart. She said she, for those of you who don't know Patty McCord, she was for 14 years the chief talent officer at Netflix. Grew that company, and their people operations from smaller than this stack here to the company that it is today. And she says, silos are just going to slow you down. The companies that are really, truly successful are collaborative and solving for the customer. And you cannot solve for the customers in silos. You just can't do it, end quote. We are taught as an industry, one way to do audience development. And we don't really know how to do it any differently. So if that's what most orchestras are doing and why, those are barriers to change. So let's talk about how to start overcoming some of these barriers. There are three areas for institutional mind shift. I promise we would come back to the board. The emphasis on the short term is often led by the board. And like I said, I'm not here to throw boards under the bus, so please hear me in saying this. This is not an attack. Uh, a reason for that is because a lot of times that's all our board members know. And in fact, many of our board members don't come from the nonprofit sector, they come from the for profit sector, right? And for profit companies, and in particular, publicly traded for profit companies, Talk about an emphasis on the short term. Oh my gosh. Yes, laughter, that's right. You know where this is going. Okay, so for profit companies, and particularly publicly traded for profit companies, have to release quarterly earnings statements. Those statements, they also then have to match or meet or exceed analyst projections, subject themselves to analyst projections, meet or exceed those projections because if they don't, the stock tanks. Uh, and ultimately serve their shareholders who absolutely want that stock value to rise, rise, and rise. Our board members have built their entire incredibly successful careers navigating short-term pressures that are even greater than what we face, I think, as nonprofit staff members sometimes. They have been very successful. That's what their entire careers have demanded of them. And then that comes sometimes into focus then when we're talking about our organizations here. Now, nonprofits have a huge advantage over this for profit mentality. We do not release quarterly earnings statements, at least publicly, that is. We release one annual tax return and audit. And let's be honest, for most of us, those public financial statements are getting harder and harder by which to paint a thriving financial picture. This goes right back to needing to believe. There's got to be a better way. <clears throat> Our nonprofits are different than for profit companies in that we do not serve, serve shareholders. We serve a mission. We need our boards to believe this too. And we need everybody to buy in to a longer term strategy. It is critical to an organizational wide change in how we look at building audiences. The second area for mind shift is going against conventional wisdom. That's exactly how Catherine started the intro. Let's talk about some assumptions of conventional wisdom, and then let's throw that all in the garbage can, okay? For years, the old model worked just fine. Again, 30, 40, 50 years ago, subscriptions did fill the majority of our seats. <clears throat> the philanthropic case for support was sort of much more intrinsic and valued by our society. It was a much easier case for support to make. 
All those things used to work just fine. And that model did not crash and burn overnight. Instead, it slowly changed and adapted as our world has changed. And as institutions, we also have slowly changed and adapted to try to keep pace with that. And in fact, as institutions, we have been incredibly smart and savvy, I would say, in going along with that change. That meant over time, adding different seasons ticket packages, not just the full season fixed seat, but choose your own and pops and all these smaller other, other ways to buy a season ticket. We developed incredibly strong fundraising departments who know every single way to ask for a gift, from in-person to online asks to mass mailings to foundations to government support, plan giving, I mean, you name it. Man, do we know how to raise money, because we have to. We have been tremendously adaptable as orchestras. The trouble, again, though, is that all of these tweaks and incremental gains have not kept pace the way uh, our art form demands of us, right? These incremental tweaks and adjustments have, that we have so suavely made have really resulted in some unintended consequences, I would say. That is that we are great at attracting people to come once, terrible at keeping them coming back again, and way too quick to upsell too much too soon. That's on both the marketing and the fundraising sides. So the point in all of this is that this conventional wisdom is not working for us anymore. And we've got to challenge that assumption and not feel like trying something different is going against the grain or rocking the boat or, or just uh, against the status quo. Because the reality is we've got to try something different. It's imperative for our entire industry. The third area for institutional mind shift is a fear of shortfalls during transition to this model. So what I always hear like I mentioned, mentioned this earlier, you know, when I hear we're going to wait to solicit people until they're ready, whether that's soliciting for a season ticket package or soliciting for a donation, we're going to wait until that relationship is ready for that ask. And then I, I mentioned kind of joke, because like, the development people get really nervous, all that kind of stuff, and board members start like scratching their neck. I mean, I've seen it all, you guys. And, and really what's so interesting is people think that stopping soliciting stops revenue, and that's not true. So this institutional mind shift is to say, that, uh, that gains are possible. The California Symphony, we started seeing gains in year one, and we're going to take a deeper dive and look at that, and also put some TSO numbers behind it, too. So gains are possible, even in year one. So just like get rid of that nervous feeling, if that's what you're feeling, because I just think it's unfounded. The silver lining is, uh, if your organization is in crisis, um, I think there's more of an appetite for change. That's my observation. Definitely the California Symphony, the board was like, just come do whatever you want. We need some help. Super crisis. Um, the organizations that think they have it all together are the ones a little more resistant. You know what I mean? So wherever you fall on that continuum, maybe there is a little appetite for change, right? Let's see. Uh, I also want to challenge the assumptions that stopping soliciting donations in year one could be a revenue loss situation. There are two reasons why that's probably it's probably not so bad after all. The first is that. When we're talking about new donors, new donors that come because they came once to take a buyer and then got the telefunding call and said, okay, here's some money, uh, those are not big gifts. Those are very low level annual fund gifts. So when you total that up, it's just not that much revenue that we're saying, we're not saying goodbye to, we're saying we're gonna wait for something bigger. The second reason why uh, year one of this transition is not so bad after all, is that you heard me say there's expense savings to be realized. Little, Pen Little Peninsula Symphony was like, we cut our subscription brochure mailing down to a third of what it used to cost us. And they were saying this all smiles, knowing that they, you know, the people who are getting the brochure are the top prospects to say, yes, sign me up. They were like, let's get this going, Aubrey. Not just uh, stopping revenue, also saving some on the expense side. So lastly, uh, I want to challenge if there is still any fear left, how much money are we going to lose? We stop soliciting some of these people in year one. Run the numbers. How much, how much revenue comes from this, this little stream we're talking about? New donors who, and we can do that math, I know the database here can do this math for us, 
new donors who came in because of, uh, they were solicited uh, by any channel after they bought a ticket or if they were a new subscriber, uh, not existing donors, but brand new donors who came in this way. Uh, first time buyers, repeat buyers, new subscribers. It's just that, not that much revenue. Oh yeah, Peninsula Symphony had the same call yesterday. They said, Aubrey, we did this math. $2,200, all of last year, is who came in from these groups of people you're talking about. And I said, oh, did you just tell me you just saved $4,000 on your subscription brochure? Uh-huh. Already, net zero impact to their budget. Okay, anybody who I've given this challenge to to actually run the numbers, it has never ever been more than 2%, 3% max of the entire operating budget. So it's just not that much money. Okay, so we've talked about what most workshops are doing and why, how do we start overcoming those barriers, and really start shifting our mindset so that we have an organizational culture that thinks about this differently. Part three is operational implementation. How do we actually start to do the work to put this theory into practice? And this gets into some of the things that I'm going to be working with the professional staff on this afternoon, some of the things we'll be doing together. The first step is to define each segment. What is the patron journey pyramid? Now, since I am working for an orchestra, this is an orchestra, it might look just like this. Sometimes I do this workshop and people say, well, before our first time attendee, you know, people visit us online and they start the journey a little earlier. Or um, I worked with a ballet company who said, you know, students in our education programs really are the gateway to a ticket sale. So they have to get into this somehow. So maybe the pyramid will look slightly different. Maybe it'll look just like this, but that's what we're gonna work on this afternoon. Step one is to build that user journey, user uh, pyramid. And then the second step is to define each segment. Build the pyramid and define each segment. So, for example, at the California Symphony, somebody's first interaction with our organization, we've said, is a first time attendee, but we've said also, we're gonna define first timers as somebody who hasn't been in four years or longer. So if you haven't been at the California Symphony in four years, one, you're really not that engaged. Two, man, that's a lot changed in four years. So we treat those people like they're brand new in terms of, in terms of how we follow up with them. So our first step is build that pyramid. What is that journey, patron journey? <coughs> and uh, and how, who are they? How will you find them and how will you track them? Because remember what gets measured, what gets managed. If we, can't, if we don't know how to run a report in our database of who newcomers are, but we definitely can't follow up with them. So that's the work we'll be doing this afternoon. Really specific, really tactical. Usually the answer to the latter is who are they, how do we find them, how do we track them. Usually the answer is transactional, some like a ticket or just move them up to the next level, or a donation, move them up to the next level. And almost always it's using our CRM to, to define them and fill those people with those lists. We're going to repeat that exercise this afternoon for every step of the journey. Step two is determine how to get from A to B. What happens when somebody's a first time attendee? So for example, at the California Symphony, when somebody's a first time attendee, we have four different communications that that person receives. The first is when they arrive at the concert, they're a new attendee, they have a letter on their seat welcoming them. We say, hey, we noticed you're new, or you haven't been in a while. We are so glad you're here, welcome. We would love to have you back again. And here's a great offer Pretty, we'll talk about offers in a second. A great aggressive offer uh, and a deadline. Any concert the rest of the season, man, we'd love to see you again. Letter on their seat welcoming them. After the concert, they get an email from us, same message. Hey, we know this is your first time, our first time in a while. We're so glad you came. We'd love to see you back again. Here's an offer, here's a deadline. <clears throat> the week following the concert, they get a postcard in the mail. Thanks for coming, we are so glad you're here. Same message over again, here's the offer, here's the deadline. And then right before the deadline, a final email saying don't forget, here's 20 bucks off your next purchase deal, ticket purchase, we'd love to, love to, love to see you again. So it's all the same thing, four different messages. Now, some people say, oh, that's like a lot, Audrey, but consider the free-for-all model. 
those first timers were getting poor communications. It was just that one was a subscription offer, the other was a digital ad, the other was a brochure, the other was a telephone call. <coughs> but now we say four times, we see you. And man, we want to bring you to the family. Our first time buyer retention rate, if 90% is the number of people who don't come back, that means 10% is the number who do. We are now consistently at 30% across any concert in the season, those newcomers are coming back within 12 months of their first purchase. It's tens of thousands of dollars in extra revenue for our organization just from newcomers. That one segment, we haven't gotten to the rest of the pyramid yet. Retention matters. All right, a couple other examples just because we are going to be working through this this afternoon. Oh, I should say one more thing. The postcard and the image they get is about the concert they just attended. We're trying to go for memory recall, memory elicitation. We're not trying to really sell them something new yet. I mean, we are, because we're trying to get them to come back. But instead, we're trying to help them remember, like, oh, yeah, that was really, that was a great performance I was just at. No picture of the music director. It's usually the guest artist or something that they saw. I love Jose, too. Uh, we'll get to him. <laughs> <laughs> OK, here, here we go, music director. All right, when somebody becomes a repeat attendee, attendee uh, then we stop at the discounts. So I should probably just confess right now, I am like the discount comp. I used to say Nazi, I feel like that's probably not appropriate. Like, I don't like just mean this person in the universe. I, I mean, I'm just, I hate discounting, I hate comp tickets. There are only three times I discount. One is when somebody's a newcomer and we want them to come back. The other is when they're a subscriber, and then we'll talk about the third one in a moment. So multi-buyers, that means I'm done discounting. That's not the desired behavior, is to give them great deals all the time. Well, we can have a hit, right? Okay, so once you've come a second time, you're a multi-buyer, repeat buyer, then instead of thinking about discounting, we think about value add. And we send them a coupon for a glass of wine. We say, hey, we've noticed you've joined us a couple times in the last few months. We really love that. Have a glass of wine on us next time you come. So we're trying to set them up for a third visit. Multi-buyers are top prospects for season ticket purchases, so we know maybe that glass of wine will be at their first concert of their new season ticket package. Maybe. Um, and then, now that they come a couple times, then we start showcasing the music director. Now they've seen the man with the stick a couple times. Now we want to say, yep, you know who that person is. Welcome back again and again. And then one more example for you all, uh, subscriber appreciation. A lot of orchestras do subscriber appreciation days. I don't know if you do them here. These are great. Uh, so there's nothing sort of like new or radical about this. What we did do though is we have a couple things. We have all of the orchestra members sign these notes. We put them all out backstage during rehearsals. We say everybody sign a couple. We're just trying to get four or five signatures on each one. And we tell all of our subscribers we have some plans that we do just for new subscribers. Because again, half of those people nationwide don't renew, so we've got some special things we do for new subscribers. But all subscribers get these subscriber appreciation days where on their seats are these cards signed by the orchestra. Okay, pro tip, it's not good enough just to have name only. People were coming up to me and every one of my staff members saying, who's Alan? I don't even know. <laughs> oh, Alan's the tempest. Point him out to me. And then it came people just like, I mean, who loves the musicians on stage? Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. And so now it's like, you need to press Alan. <laughs> but, um, and so we do it, we do it. But, um, it, but it's so amazing, though, when people are like, I gotta know who that rock star is beside my card. It's like, man, their signature carries way more weight than mine, anything. So, okay, we put these on the chair subscriber appreciation. It's also very important when we do this. This happens at the concert set immediately before we announce the next season. So right before the new season is announced, we tell them how much we love them. It's a lot of work to have orchestra members sign all these cards, right? Mm. We love our season ticket holders. Concert happens, hopefully everybody's happy. Next week, two days later, they're getting a renewal invoice in their mailbox, and that timing is absolutely strategic. Our subscription renewal rates are about 85%. Strategic, timing matters, attention matters. Okay, so those are just some examples. How do we get somebody from A to B, from whatever step they're at, to the next step? And again, that's some of the exercise that we'll be doing this afternoon. Step three is other segments to plan for. 
So there are some people who don't behave the way we want them to. In a perfect world, people are loving us more and more and engaging and coming back and then donating and they just do everything we want them to do and they're wonderful and lovely. And then there are other people who don't behave that way and they fall off the pyramid. So there are some other segments that we're gonna make a plan for and the goal is always to get them on that pyramid either again or for the first time. So in the case of special event attendees, so often in our industry, and I've been there so I know, we feel like the event is the finish line. We work so hard, we procure the auction items, we do all the work to fill the tables. I mean, if these events are up, they're just a lot, I know. And we work and work and work, and by the end, we're just running on adrenaline, and then the event happens, and man, we raise some money, and it's, it's, it's exciting. And then at the end, we just think, oh my gosh, I'm so exhausted. And we think we're done. And that's not true, because at special events, if we've done our job well, there are a lot of people there connecting with us for the very first time. So we need a plan for them, too. We, how do we capitalize on that awesome experience and get them right on this journey with us for a longer relationship? Special event attendees. Other segments that we're going to make a plan for. Lots of buyers. So I said there are only three times when I discount. Last buyers is the third. When somebody's new and when we want them to come back again. When somebody's buying in bulk, subscribing, we want to reward that behavior with a discount at good price. And when we need them to come back because they have been inactive. Last buyers. We, every couple of years, for example, we do a reactivation campaign. And so some of those people who haven't been in four years, we've done that. We'll send out a mailing and say, hey, we haven't seen you in a while. Here's 50% off if you come to any of our main conferences in our season. Some of those people do re-engage, then they're right back on this first time wheel. Okay, uh, last subscribers, same kind of thing. We want to do everything we can to get those people back. Last donors, gosh, when we talk about fundraising, the top prospects for a donation are our current donors, our newest people. Our second top prospect is equally subscribers, multi-year subscribers, who've proven they're loyal, they're just not donating yet, they're ready for that next step, and equal to that is people who've donated in the past. Yeah, I get that. Last donor is incredibly important. And then inactive accounts. So many times, if we were to, our databases look like, a, like an iceberg, you know what I mean? What's special about an iceberg? Who knows? What, like, what's a little more than 10 percent? That's right. You look at an iceberg, that's just exactly what our CRMs look like. It's like the super engaged people are this little 10% that's above water, and then there's just like a behemoth underwater of people who have like no interaction with Glenn, you're like falling on the floor laughing on this. It's all the huge amount of people who just uh, don't interact with us. They've like gone cold. And what's so interesting about these inactive accounts. Some organizations, Peninsula Symphony, who I keep referring to, they were doing this. They were emailing or mailing, rather, all of them their season brochure. We don't need to be doing that. Uh, so, for example, to make a plan for them is uh, at the California Symphony, we don't do this every year, similar to the last fire example, but we have done a once and done campaign. And there is research straight out of the University of Chicago, the School of Business that they were with some nonprofits who had mega mailing lists, so really big sample size, like St. Jude's or you know, Smile Train or some of those like really, really big ones. And they did this test. For the people who had gone cold, three years or more of no activity whatsoever, what if they got a mailing, they, they A-B tested this, some people just got the same solicitation, same fundraising appeal that everybody else got, and then the other half of the group got an appeal that said, <coughs> We'll make you a deal. If you donate, you can check this box and we'll never bother you again. <laughs> they called it the once and done campaign. And guess what? These people who got this other solicitation, one, more of them replied, more of them donated, and very few of them actually checked the box to never talk to them again. So instead they reactivated these completely cold, bottom part of the iceberg accounts. Almost all of them didn't say don't talk to me, most of them put themselves right back in that pipeline for future engagement. We did this at the California Symphony a few years ago, and I kind of wanted to see, we had all these inactive accounts, and I thought, well, let's just see. Sure enough, the response rate, 
was 17 times <coughs> more donations than what we had received last time we did a campaign when we had just like mailed everybody. More. And I think like two people checked the box. One person gave us literally a dime in an envelope and checked the box. And said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> but everybody else who responded, man, they got right up on the pipeline for future solicitations. So inactive accounts, generally I say don't worry about them, we don't need them. Every once in a while we give it a try just to see if we can get some of those people back to the water. Okay. Step four, create a coordinated internal calendar. So getting all of this information in one place is rarely done, in my opinion, and what I've seen in, at organizations I've worked with and worked at, I'm saying nodding heads, yeah, it's very rarely in one place. And what happens is, uh, usually, is especially the larger the organization we go, is that this information lives in multiple places, right? Okay, so we start seeing that, uh, these bodies of work are developed in silos, right? So we start seeing, you know, social media calendars over here, the subscription campaigns over here, the development appeal campaigns over here, and the timeline for that. So what we did with the California Symphony is if we, if we are saying we have to break down the marketing and development silo and instead make one customer focused engine, we said, well, we gotta have some place as messy or granular as it is where all our public facing communications reside. So for us, the Google Calendar it doesn't have to be that way. You guys you can pick whatever works for you. But we said, whatever the public facing communication is, we're going to map it out. And so we're going to work on that this afternoon of, you know, what do you map out first, and then what else, and then when does this get slotted in? So we'll work on sort of the order of operations for all of that. But to have it within one place so that we know who we're talking to, when we're talking to them, and what we're saying and making sure that doesn't conflict with this other thing happening over here. Not rocket science, but we're gonna do it. Create a quarter man calendar. Okay. So, more on the how, the implementation. How do we break down those silos? Well, the first is to identify somebody to lead the shift in operations. We're talking about marketing development working as one customer focused engine. Identify somebody to lead the shift in operations. This is already happening here. Bruce and Glenn have just been hired. Bruce is our head of patron loyalty. That train has already left the station. That's happening. Uh, this is really a shift at putting the customer at the center of what we do. And I always say, and you guys got it right, you get somebody who knows marketing first. Because Marketing and development can be very similar. And it's in the low level annual fund. Major gifts is a totally different skill set, and we're going to talk about that. So I always say somebody who gets marketing, who gets these public facing communications, who their whole life has been trained to think about the customer in that way, we're going to get somebody like that to oversee it. And you guys did. Good luck. Okay, so what does this type of position look like? Uh, as I said, it's somebody who knows marketing first, and I always say marketing can learn annual fund. Annual fund can't learn marketing necessarily or not as easily. And the reason I say this is because, again, annual fund, not major gifts, but like direct mail appeal, all that kind of stuff is very similar to marketing. So both marketing, global annual funds use the same tactics. They both uh, use direct mail, the phone room, social media, and even targeted digital advertising to support those campaigns. It's just that uh, on the marketing side, it's like a postcard or a brochure. On the development side, it's a letter. Both of them have email support if done well. Both of them have some digital media support if done well. It's just really the same stuff. Both marketing and low-level annual fund are similar in that they are both designed to elicit an emotional response in order to drive a transaction. One is a ticket purchase, one is a donation. Both have the same vehicles for that transaction. Online, taking it over the phone, or sending it something by mail. I just think they're so similar. And yet so often at our organizations, we break up that labor and say, this one's called development, and this one's called marketing. And we're gonna break those silos down and say, no, they're gonna be people in charge of developing relationships with other people. 
And then what's different, this is another way to look at this and reframe this, is we're talking about mass communication, everything I just said, versus one-on-one -on -one relationships. And that's when we start talking about major gifts. And that's what lines up saying. That is a different skill set in my opinion. We're having one-on-one -on -one conversations. We really are developing a much more personal relationship. That, that's different work than all this other mass communication. So that's the new way we break down the division of labor. And again, that process has already begun here. I will say, though, major gifts is the same concept. I started off this by saying major gifts is sort of what inspired this whole journey, right? It's because the major gifts officers have been smart for years. And now we're trying to catch up everything else. Okay, so I always say somebody who, who knows marketing, somebody who knows communications. So why does communications and all of this matter? I think from PR to social media to the program book, uh, all of that matters to have one organizational voice. This is another area that a lot of times it's really difficult to have the same voice across all these channels. And why does one voice matter? Because the same person who sees that ad online and clicks on it, then goes to the website and browses and hopefully buys a ticket, gets an order confirmation, comes to the concert, reads the program book. That same person has got to be communicated with cohesively. Somebody who understands communication is like, oh, we see all of that. Someone who understands human resources. Now, I do not mean human resources in terms of benefits and health care. And that's not what I'm talking about, to oversee all of this work. I'm talking about uh, company culture. Somebody who understands that when we're talking about all of these things and having one customer-focused engine and putting the patron at the center of everything we do, that's organizational why. That's not the job of this team or that department. That is all of us, no matter our staff function or role. So somebody who understands that uh, has got to be in charge of this role. And again, we brought on Bruce for exactly this reason. Um, at a smaller organization, I always say, in some ways this is easier because, and I would put you guys as mid-size, not small. Um, at a small organization, there's fewer staff, so everybody's jobs are so much broader, and it's sort of a little more blurry, a little more gray. At a bigger organization like this, I think it means redrawing department lines. That's the direction we're headed. So uh, just as sort of a heads up on that, I think that that's okay. We don't have to say we accept the same organizational structure that has existed for 50 years. Maybe it's time to do that differently. I think that's okay. None of this is new or radical. It has been tested, vetted, authenticated, uh, proven time and again in other industries. Kylie McCord said it about Netflix. We put the patron and our customer rather, the customer first. This is not a radical. Arts and culture, and specifically some of the orchestras, are behind. <laughs> so here's another way to look at this. Now let's get a little closer to home. Catherine and the team sent me some revenue for the Tucson Symphony. So another way to say all this is that if we're becoming a patron-focused culture, organizational live, then let's look at it. This is the Tucson Symphony 2020 budget, the revenue that is, the revenue breakdown. Okay, in my opinion, this is really hard to make sense of. There's a lot of things happening here. That, I mean, this is what it would look like for any organization. I'm not picking on you. And typically what happens, most of us look at our, our budgets, our revenue sides like this. Contributed revenue versus earned revenue. That's even the way the budget, like the profit and loss statement, is broken down. Not just here, but at so many officials across the country. And um, when I look at this, it sort of reminds me of that free for all journey. There's just a lot going on. And uh, you break it down this way, which says it reinforces silos. And the long haul model is saying, no, 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 there's a totally different implementation for this. There's a different way to look at these same numbers. If we're looking at patrons and keeping the patron at the center, why don't we look at patron-generated revenue versus not patron-generated? Let's see, let's just look at that again. Contributing versus earned, 
No, we're going to focus on people generated revenue versus not. It looks totally different. And when we look at our budget breakdown like this, 91% of the revenue in the Tucson Symphony 2020 budget comes from people, the people we serve. Okay, there's one more Patty McCord story because if you, okay, at the conference, you guys heard her speak. She's telling this story. She was saying, uh, she was talking about the Blockbuster quarterly earnings calls. Do you guys remember this? Where she was saying, yeah, uh, she was saying, you know, they were listening in on this public quarterly earnings call, and the head of Blockbuster was saying, I'm not worried about Netflix. I don't think this is competition. I don't think this is an issue. And Patty said on the wall behind them, they're looking at their own subscriber numbers, their revenue numbers, and the chart that looks like this and their growth. And she said, they all took the Netflix people all turned to each other and said, oh my god, the Blockbuster people, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know. And that is how I feel when I look at a diagram like this. Most orchestras don't know. Most orchestras are stuck here. And we're saying, no. We get it. We see what the other ones don't see. And I believe to my core that the orchestra that gets this is the one that is going to thrive because we know where all the right things come from. And everything we do is going to be to serve that. Okay, so how does the long haul model play out? I said we would come back to this really specifically year one, two, three, four, and where we are today. Year one, we talked about this. Organizations say there is some potential reduction in low-level annual fund gifts. It's usually not that much. The California Symphony, we saw gains in year one. We saw in our first year, I think it was 14% increase uh, through in ticket sales, 14% increase in year one, just through emphasis on patron retention. We also saw in year one a reduction in marketing and development expenses due to more focus and qualified mailing lists and uh, a reduction in some of our acquisition costs. We saw musicians become engaged in the process. We even talked about musicians a ton, just a little bit. But what was so interesting to me is I started asking the orchestra members, are you willing to sign these cards? Or for us, we said new donors at a certain level are going to get a thank you note from a musician. So many of them. I always make it optional because not everybody in the orchestra wants to help. But the ones who do, man, they raised their hand and said, yeah, I want to help. And then what happens, you know, we'd send out, so then an orchestra member writes this thing, you know, and I would give them a script and say, you copy this exactly. I'm so-and-so, I play the harp, I, I just want to thank you for your donation. It really makes an impact um, in me being able to do what I do. I started getting calls from donors saying, oh my gosh, I got a, a letter from the harpist. <laughs> Aubrey, thank you. And I'm like, oh, well, we were thanking you for your donation, but thank you for thanking us for thanking you. So, um, <laughs> so it's like all together. Yes. Musicians became more engaged. Staff culture began to change. As we started creating this vision, you know, there was a lot of people who said, I get it. I get that pie graph. I get it. Sign me up. And there were other people who said, oh, I also get it. I'm out of here. And that's okay. I think that is totally okay. And we started seeing, you know, Jim Collins would say it this way. Are there any Jim Collins fans? Business author? Okay, a couple. He always says it this way. You've got to get the right people on the bus. And that's what this is, especially in year one. Like, okay, we're changing some things. Not everybody likes that. That's okay. But you got, but I already said the train has left the station. So you're invited to be on board, but if you don't want to be, that's okay. That's not a problem. <laughs> All right, the people who, who didn't understand sort of got off the bus. The people who did, they then what started happening was like more engagement, uh, higher staff productivity. I mean, like, it was, it was good, you guys. Okay, so that's all, that's all year one of implementing this model. Year two, how this played out. Subscription renewal rates and new subscriptions increased. You saw that very first slide, and we'll come back to it. Across the country, subscriptions are on the decline. By year two, our season ticket packages and the subscribers were increasing across all packages, to your own, full season, all of it. Our single ticket sales continued to increase while acquisition costs remained flat. Almost everything in our business costs more next year than it does this year. This was one area where we got to keep it flat. 
Single ticket churn rates decrease. If I said 90% don't, don't come back, 10% do, that churn started shifting. Churn rates decrease. Development appeals saw higher response rates. More people were saying, I see what you're doing, and I want to be a part of that. The donor base grew at every level of giving. Yes, those low level annual, annual fund people, but also those major donors too. They said, yeah, I'm gonna lean in. I want to see this succeed. Sign me up. New staff were hired as people got off the bus. New staff were hired with higher quality bar. Because now we know what we're doing and we're able to articulate that, we can set that bar. And people are saying, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I want to be a part of that. Uh, the ability, oh, okay, staff, you love this. The ability to pay higher salaries to attract this talent. When you start making more money, we get to invest it back into the people doing this work, which is really just a fancy way to say we're just going to invest right back in the organization to do this even more and even better. By year two, I was able to start paying my staff more and get qualified people uh, replacing the ones who didn't want to be part of this. Okay. Year three, our subscriber renewal rate hit a, a then high of 85%. Since then, it's creeped up closer to 90%. Renewal rate among a growing subscriber base. Our audience age decreased. None, none of this that I've said so far today is about how to attract younger audiences. Like none of this, right? It's just that younger people were coming and by improving our retention tactics and improving our marketing tactics, we're gonna do a whole thing tomorrow morning on digital marketing and how we can up our game there. By just doing those things and keeping them coming back, our average age started to go down. Our concert capacity average, 89%. Averaged. <clears throat> Individual giving revenue by year three was up 61%. Donor households up 180%. Open staff positions attracted an even greater volume of applicants and more qualified applicants. As a hiring manager, man, did my job get easier by year three of this model. Loved it. <clears throat> Our fiscal year that year ended with a 10% surplus. We had broken even the previous two years. Now I'm going to all those foundations, waving the profit and loss statement, saying, see, look, profit, net revenue. We're paying down past debt. We are getting rid of those ugly numbers on the books. We are Our overall operating budget was 40%, as I mentioned before, by year three. Year four, and then continuing to today, this is the slide you saw at the very beginning. The gains continue. What a virtuous cycle. So I'll ask again, what if even a fraction of these gains were true for this organization? This is how the narrative can change. So, what if some of these games were true? Let's look at some Tucson Symphony numbers. So, this is some data that was sent to me in advance, and we're just going to talk through it a little bit. First time buyer retention for the Tucson Symphony, 16, 17 season, and 17, 18 Symphony, 20%, 21% of first time buyers are coming back to the following year. Okay, I said 10% was the national average, so you guys actually are doing fairly well here above the national average. The California Symphony, we're at 30%, but 20%, not that bad. Um, so, either everything's going all right, or there's not enough new people coming in the door. And I said, I've said over and over, I normally do not focus on acquisition. So, uh, I've only mentioned this because one concert I saw had just 100 new ticket buyers, but it could have been an outlier. So, really what I'm saying is not bad, that's not what we're going to focus our attention. New subscriber retention, renewal rates. Same as the industry average, I said it's about half. 50% nationwide for new subscribers renewing. Okay. Well, congratulations, you're right on trend with the mediocrity of the rest of the country. <laughs> so we're going to focus some attention here. Um, and just to be positive about it, here's some quick math. I started calculating this. If this were to go up to 70% of the California Symphony, et cetera, our renewal rates, including first time buyers, are 80% or higher. If that were to go up to 70%, 
that would be oh, using our average using an average subscriber price of two hundred dollars. That's less than the, the average uh, for two cents and average subscriber subscriber package is about four hundred some odd dollars. So if we even use a lower average, knowing that new buyers aren't buying as many packages in the season, about a two hundred dollar average season ticket price, that would be uh, thirteen thousand dollars in extra. Okay, nothing to sneeze at. Thirteen thousand gets better. Uh, let's look at overall subscriber retention. 80% in 17, 75% in 17, 18. If, well, what I would say is this is inconsistent, right? So you gotta try to get that a little higher. If that subscription renewal rate was 85% instead of 75%, again, California Symphony 85%, closer to 90% now, if we go up to 85%, that's an additional $106,000 in revenue just from this segment. And this is where it gets really interesting. This is, this is, I said it's a virtual cycle, it starts compounding. If, like in 16, 17, if we got that 54% up to 70% and in that year had an additional 13K, then those people who then renew at 85%, this would become $129,700 more money in the budget. Who wants $129,700 then? I'll tell you. All right, like half of you. <laughs> so this is how it starts to work in a compounding way. Okay, subscribers who also donate. The Tucson Symphony is just below the industry average. The industry average is 28% of subscribers who also donate. Uh, so I would say we're going to focus here a little bit, but also work on renewing those subscribers. So the quick math, back of the napkin math on this is if the subscriber donor number went up to 40% with the same average gift, the average gift is about $1,000 here, same average gift, <coughs> California Symphony is at 43% by the way, so if we got it to 40%, that would be an additional $328,000, or $900, $300, $300, $300, $300, $300, so that makes sense, $329,000. From just increasing the renewing subscribers and getting to now we're talking. Okay. Even if the average gift size is lower, maybe all these new donors aren't coming in at $1,000, even if their average gift is lower, we're easily talking about another $4 million in revenue. I mean, why are we jumping up and down? Right, right? Right? Like, <laughs> okay. New donor retention. I would say this is inconsistent. And we've got some opportunity here. So if new donor retention went up to 50%, if half of all new donor households renewed, that's uh, $50,594 just from keeping new donors coming back. All right, I love it. Bruce is like, I got a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Because we've started 
start seeing the audience that grows, the revenue that follows, man, it just compels us to do more because we start to see the fruits of our labor. And we start to see that, yes, this matters. This makes a difference. It makes everything else we do a little easier and a little more possible. So for example, programming that adventurous piece was they wanted to do. $736,000 makes that a little easier, a little more possible. Uh, going to the bargaining table, like the union, it's a little easier, not a lot, a little easier, a little more possible. Um, creating a more compelling compensation package for that insanely talented principal player we want to land or have stay for another several years makes it a little easier, a little more possible. It makes hiring and keeping the talented staff needed to do this work a little easier, a little more possible. All of this, everything we do at Symphony Orchestra becomes a little easier, a little more possible when all of us are bought in to doing this. So lastly, when in doubt, do something, not nothing. I give this advice all of the time. A, B test an offer you're not sure about, just try it, see if it works. Uh, or, or A, B test it and see which version works better. Uh, pilot test a new initiative. Maybe we don't have to roll out an entire new program that costs a ton of money, but maybe there's some small pilot version we could run six months, a year, see how it goes. If it works, great, let's really put some resource behind it. If not, fine, we'll try something new next time. Uh, do something. Do anything and see if we get results. Because to do nothing means no change in our audiences or our organization and how we're serving everyone. I am in this business for the long haul, and I hope that all of you will join me. Thank you. Tucson. 
Tucson Symphony is another one. Fun. We are in the entertainment business. We want to have fun. And the second thing he said, Carl, that was so good was you want them, you want patrons to tell other people. So one of my uh, latest authors uh, that I love is a marketing guru by the name of Mark Schaefer. He wrote this book called The Marketing Rebellion. And he says, and this is based on his research, that two thirds of all marketing for any brand is done by their customers. Meaning, as a company, we have control of one third of our marketing. That's either horrifying or exciting, because if we are doing the work to make people have fun and activating that group to be our evangelists, then great. We got two thirds of our marketing rocking and rolling for free. If we don't, this is where organizations get very nervous, because we only have control of one third of our marketing. So I love all that. What else? I saw other hands. You're speaking about the classical music. We haven't talked about mu what music's going to be performed by the orchestra. And as I mentioned to you on the hall, I saw PBS last night. I don't know if many of you saw it. It was the Viennese Philharmonic. There were 8,500 people <laughs> on the lawn of a castle in Vienna. It was at, the setting was absolutely magnificent. But the music, and you know the conductor, uh, he, played, he played Chopin, he played Barber, he played Strauss, uh, he played Bern, uh, Bern, Bernstein. Uh, it was a fan, and the audience was young. It was a, people my age <laughs> there, but there was a lot of young people. It, but it, the other thing, it was free. It wasn't three times. But how do you get uh, the younger generation to love classical music when they have probably never heard it their, in their house? Oh, it's normal, right? Yes, it is. Hey, would you ask that question? Oh my gosh, this is like, okay. Woo, here we go, guys. Okay. <laughs> Programming. As an industry, I think orchestras way overly focused on programming. So let me finish before you start getting really alarmed at what I'm saying. There's absolutely a discussion to have about programming. <coughs> uh, we need to diversify the, the pieces and the composers that we perform. We need to be pushing our audiences forward. All of that I believe is true. However, as an industry, my opinion is that we way over focus on programming. We think that programming is the silver bullet that's gonna do all that work for us. And we have decades of research and data in our industry telling us that's not true. That 90% no return rate is 10 years old. That statistic has not changed in 10 years, despite orchestras of all sizes and all corners of America trying different things with programming. Harry Potter concerts, Beethoven cycles, you know, new music festival, uh, whatever it is, traditional, non-traditional, movie pops, whatever, none of that has moved the needle in terms of retention. So I, programming is very important. <clears throat> it is not going to do the hard work that needs to be done to put the customer at the center of what we do. Okay. Uh, the second thing you said that I got so excited about, now I have to, okay, calm down, Aubrey. Re <laughs> refocus. What did you say? Conductors, programming, young people. Um, oh, free concerts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you all heard me say, I'm, I'm like crazy about limiting discounts, and I am super crazy about free concerts. Uh, and I don't know if you do free concerts, so just, okay, so I'm super offensive. Just apologize in advance. Um, I question whether or not we should be giving it away for free. Free has no value, and what we do has incredible value. It is incredibly expensive, it is incredibly <coughs> irreplaceable and irreplicable. You can't turn on Spotify and get an orchestra that's fine. So I question free. I have no problem with accessible pricing. Five dollars better than free. That attaches a value. That implies a transaction. When people pay something, not nothing, there's a, a lower dropout rate. More people will come when they bought that low price ticket. So that's my like mini soapbox version on free concerts. Um, and, and also it's really hard when there's a free concert how do you capture that person's information to invite them back again? So, all right, that's how I feel about free concerts. I'm not saying don't do accessible things. I'm not saying that pricing can't be really um, 
reduced as a barrier to entry. But I think all these things, programming, pricing, all of that, none of that can happen unless we do all of this, right? So, thank you for bringing all of that up. Yes? The other thing that she said that struck the chord with me was the venue. I just, we don't know it's so dumb. We don't have any tassels. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's like this many orchestras who are like, I love my venue. <laughs> this many. Almost everybody has some big problem with their venue. Um, I can't stand the venue where the California Symphony plays. We've doubled our audience despite that. So, and, and I also say there's two different ways to approach that. I'm not saying we have to accept that. We might, but uh, but there are two ways to approach that problem. One is okay, we start really focusing on patron loyalty and developing all these relationships and everything we just talked about, and, and that hopefully will move the needle because we need that. Or let's just embark on like a $200 million capital campaign and let's just raise that money to build a new venue. I mean, which one seems a little more viable, right? So I think, um, I think the venue thing, it's just so common on orchestras to say, I'm not happy with my venue. And I'm not saying that that's not okay to feel that way, I'm saying there are other things that can be done, and we don't talk about not accepting uh, assumptions. We don't have to accept that. And we can say, look, we're going to have fun despite this venue. Well, and, well, the other thing is, obviously, the NFL doesn't play all of their concerts at their castle. So we do you need an occasional special concert somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps mm -hmm. that's maybe that, that's the creative thinking. Maybe there is something else that can be done. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a question about branding. Uh, I'm wondering what ways you're, you're thinking about that or whether you talk about it in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. When I think of an orchestra, can you think of any other group of 75 musicians that play together? Any other kind of venue? It's classical music. That's right. And the joy of playing together with that side of human people is, is what's unique about classical music, but it also makes it very contemporary. Mm -hmm. and, and I think thinking about classical music as written by people, and this isn't exactly true, but that the people have long been dead, mm -hmm. you, you know, there's a lot of the classical genre, and, it, and one of the characteristics is the number of people, uniquely so, who play together in the way that they do, and it's an educational uh, opportunity mm -hmm. uh, for classical music, and this is a form of rebranding. We're not old music, we're contemporary, we're just playing it happy somewhat that can be written by some people. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Here, so I, I always say now, educate, this is another silo of conversation, education department, marketing department. No. <laughs> I believe that good marketing is in fact education. So I like that, yeah. All right, yes, Adam. So I'm hesitant to ask the question because it may be related to acquisition and totally bought into retention, so. That's okay. Um, demographics, we have a large Hispanic population. So I'm curious about your thoughts um, and maybe your experience with help from Symphony with the customer diversity mm -hmm. and any outreach in that way. I love that question. So, yes, you're right. Everything I said is like not, not acquisition, not acquisition, not retention, because I think that's step one. Mm -hmm. At the California Symphony, uh, I'm trying to think, I think it was year three of this model that we started. I'm not saying you guys have to wait, I'm just saying for us, we were trying to get sort of the house in order, and then we said, oh my gosh, we, we also have a big Hispanic population. And where the California Symphony is based just outside of San Francisco, it's about 25% Hispanic and Latino. Is it probably higher than that here, or no? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. So, our baseline data showed that about two to three percent of our audience for any given performance was uh, Latinx audiences, and so, we said, man, there is money on the table if we can, if we can do this. And so what we started doing uh, was a few things. We, we made an organizational commitment to diversity across every facet of the organization. We said for uh, the, the composers we program, we are going to commit at the time it was 20% of all of the pieces or all the composers on the season, 20% will be either living composers, women composers, or composers of color, just 20%. The national average at the time was 2%, now it's up to 8%, so still exceeding that national average. Um, we said, okay, so we're gonna 
adapt the, the, the composer we perform. Uh, we said we are going to, for the guest artists we bring in, and we have as a guest conductor, we're not just going to make a list of all white people. We're going to make sure that we are looking at viable options for soloists of color, artists of color, women, men, equal, uh, and that's who we're going to put on stage. Auditions, we said for blind auditions for the musicians, we're going to keep the screen up to the very end. Some orchestras do, which is proven to help uh, the equity in hiring decisions. Some orchestras take the screen down for the last round, which is shown to, to make that decision, it let some bias creep into those decisions. Um, we said for the staff I hire in the office, I gotta really update my hiring practices to make sure that my own unintentional bias isn't creeping into my hiring decisions. So that we can make sure that the staff I'm hiring is representative of the community we serve, not just in ethnicity, but in, in sexual orientation, in gender, in any way somebody can be like truly different and special than anybody else. We said, okay, I got some work to do on that. And I can talk a whole ton about hiring practices and what we've done there. And same thing on the board. We said, okay, when I first joined the California Symphony, we had one woman on the board, one person of color. And I remember, especially on the gender, I remember looking around and saying, has anybody noticed this book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we said, we got work to do. And so we said, okay, when we start vetting and recruiting other board members, for every man we look at bringing on, can we also look at bringing on a woman? Can we look at bringing on not just one person of color, but a new class of board members so that it's not like the only or the other person or this kind of awkward situation we're creating? Can we just bring in multiple people at once and create a culture of, yeah, we've got new people coming in, we've got some long timers, and we are all here together. So we started doing that work, and then in conjunction with that, we said, okay, now we gotta put our money where our mouth is. We started running digital ads in Spanish, targeting Spanish speakers. Now it's just on Facebook in the same way on Facebook, uh, we can do pop culture ads targeting pop culture lovers and uh, Beethoven ads targeting classical music aficionados. We said we can write, we can translate those ads and run ads in Spanish targeting people who speak Spanish. And in the first year, that's all we did. Talk about pilot project, that was that for us. We said the easiest, cheapest thing we can do is translate some digital ads and put a little bit of money behind it. We saw about a 50% increase in Latinx audience buying tickets just from some ads and some different composers on the program. And then, man, foundations really love that, so then we got to go get grant funding and say, look, our audience is diversifying, and I got a, a foundation to help underwrite a new website redevelopment project. That it's this whole, I mean, website redevelopment projects are costly, and one feature of this whole redesign was an English-Spanish toggle, so that when the people clicked on the ad in Spanish, they could then land on a page in Spanish. So the first year they were putting on an ad in Spanish and landing on an English website. Still, still, <laughs> sales went up to this group. So um, then Foundation said, I see what you're doing, I want to fund that. And so they like, opened up this whole new area for funding that we hadn't yet uh, tapped into. And so we did that, new website. Now consistently about 20% of our website traffic is from Spanish-speaking visitors. Um, and then I started, we started, okay, here's what happened. As we started seeing ticket sales increase from this group, talk about organizational-wide shift, we then said, uh, I gotta welcome them from this stage in Spanish. And I took some Spanish in high school, and I'm definitely not bilingual. I said, Robert, you gotta go back and you gotta learn how to welcome people in one or two sentences in Spanish. So I did. And then I learned there were some people in the orchestra saying, Aubrey, um, I speak Spanish, can I do that? <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then what happened at this last concert, we had musicians in the orchestra come out and welcome everybody. One spoke in English, one spoke in Spanish, and we welcomed everybody to the concert hall. And oh my gosh, it's like, Aubrey, you are so irrelevant. You're not like, they just like brought the house down with that alone almost, you know? And so now we're talking about creating a place where nobody is an other, everybody is welcome, everybody belongs, we're saying, I see you, and it is, you are welcome here. And so, and, but it took a lot of collaboration across a lot of different parts of the organization to really be, I think, real about it. So, yeah, I love that, yeah. All right, we done? I think we're about time yeah. to wrap up.